Okay, I'm going to record this and post it. So guys, managerial accounting, we are in for a wonderful semester to learn about the um, this course, managerial accounting. Let me download this. And we will start. with this course here. So most of you have completed financial accounting. Managerial accounting, many people are scared of, but quite honestly, I think it is much easier than financial accounting. In the financial accounting class, we learned all about debits and credits and financial statements and statement of cash flows. But the financial accounting class was primarily concerned with promi providing information to the external users. Um, where this class focuses more on the, um, of course, measuring transactions, and communicating them in the form of financial statements. But the focus is to internal users, those individuals within a company, so they can make plans, improve the operations, and ultimately make decisions for their business. In order to understand this course, this chapter focuses on classifying costs. We're going to assign costs to what we call cost objects. And we're going to account for cost in the manufacturing companies, ultimately preparing financial statements. And part of managerial accounting is to try to determine how costs can change in response to various activity changes. Ultimately learning or providing information so those managers can make the necessary decisions. So the first one is looking at cost classifications, focusing on what we will call direct costs and indirect costs. So direct costs are really easily traced to a unit of product or other cost object, such as direct materials and direct labor. So those individuals, employees that are working directly on the factory line have direct costs associated with a product. And that direct material that goes into the production of those that product would be direct materials. Indirect costs are not easily traced to a unit of product or other cost object, such as a big grouping called manufacturing overhead. Indirect costs are incurred to support a lot of different cost objects and they can't easily be easily be traced to just one um, product, such as rent, utilities, general office expenses. They are combined to benefit all the production. So our next objective is to give examples of the three categories. In this course, we break costs down into direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. The direct materials are the raw materials that ultimately become a part of the product and can be traced to it. So if we're dealing with an automobile and we purchase radios, that radio is a direct material that will go into that automobile's completion. That's an example of a raw material. 
direct labor cost are labor costs that are easily traced to the individual units of product. Okay, um, wages paid to automobile assembly workers would be that. Okay, but manufacturing overhead is a huge bucket and it includes all these costs except the direct materials and the direct labor. These are costs that are all put into a bucket that can't be traced easily to finished products. It includes indirect materials and indirect labor costs that cannot easily be traced to specific units of product. So, examples. Examples of manufacturing overhead, depreciation on the manufacturing equipment, utility costs, property taxes, insurance premiums to operate the facility. So there's a lot that go into this huge bucket we call manufacturing overhead. So we know that we're gonna break, classify costs and break them down into direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Now we're going to also understand other types of cost called prime cost and conversion cost. Prime cost include direct materials and direct labor. Conversion costs, will be direct labor and manufacturing overhead. All of those are part of the manufacturing costs. There are non-manufacturing costs within a manufacturing company. Selling cost and administrative cost, we consider non-manufacturing. They do not go into producing the product. But selling costs are important and needed to secure the order and to deliver the products. They can be direct or they can be indirect, but they do not go into the manufacturing costs of the product. Administrative costs relate to all of the executive, organizational, clerical, costs. Again, those can be direct or indirect, but both of these categories are not related to the manufacturing. So guys, in this class, we're going to spend a lot of time doing problems because that's how you learn. So the PC Works assembles custom computers from components supplied by various manufacturers. The company's very small. It's assembly shop and retail sales store are housed in a single facility in a Redmond, Washington industrial park. Listed on the next slide are some of the costs that the company incurs. So we need to decide for each of these costs, indicate if it would most likely be classified as direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, selling, or administrative. So, we're just going to kind of go through these right now. The cost of a hard drive installed on a computer would be direct materials. The cost of advertising would be selling. The wages of employees who assemble the computers would be direct labor. Sales commissions paid to the salespeople would be selling. The salary of the assembly shop supervisor would be manufacturing overhead. The salary of the company's accountant 
would be administrative. The depreciation on equipment used to test assembled computers would be manufacturing overhead. Rent on the facility, probably the facility as a whole could be broken into manufacturing overhead, selling and administrative, depending what the pro ratio, pro ratted um, percentage of the uses for the different operations. So if the whole building is used for everything, then the space that's used for manufacturing would be prorated to manufacturing overhead and then likewise to the other two departments. So this just starts to give you an understanding of how various activities can be linked or categorized into the different direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, selling costs, or administrative costs. Now, <clears throat> how do we prepare financial statements? Well, when we're in a manufacturing company, we need to separate out those costs to make the product from those period costs, those costs that occur during the period. Product costs are only expensed when those products are sold. So all the cost included to produce a product get attached to that unit of product and they stay attached to it as long as that product is sitting in inventory. Once the product is sold, then it becomes a cost of goods sold. So for manufacturing companies, product costs include raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. So those raw materials are those that are sitting in the warehouse waiting to be utilized. Work in process are all the units of product that are just partially complete at the end of the period. They aren't finished yet. So those items that are sitting in work in process are still part of inventory, but since they have not been completed, we keep them as part of our manufacturing product cost in the category called work in process. Those finished goods category are all the completed units of product that are waiting to be sold. They're ready to be sold, but they haven't been sold yet. So for inventory with a manufacturing company, know that these, these manufacturing costs or inventory will be broken down into three categories. Those raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. When direct materials are used in production, we then will create a journal entry to credit them out of raw materials, which reduces, you know, if inventory is an asset, the credit takes it out of raw materials and will debit it, increase our work in process. Any direct labor and manufacturing overhead costs will be added to our work in process. Okay, one second, guys, one sec. One second. Okay, 
so the direct materials, the manufacturing overhead, the direct labor, <clears throat> all get added to this work in process while the product is being manufactured. Once those products are completed, we then credit them out of, sorry guys, we credit them out of work in process and we debit or include them now into finished goods. Okay, when a manufacturer finally sells its finished goods to customers, the costs are transferred from finished goods to finally cost of goods sold. So we see the product costs are those costs linked with the product, the, the manufacturing. They include direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. That will be an inventory item and they will stay on the balance sheet until that product is sold. At that time, when the product is sold, it will become part of the income statement as the expense cost of goods sold. Period cost include the selling cost and administrative cost um, that are part of the income statement. I'm so sorry, guys. And they get expensed immediately. They, those period costs are non-manufacturing costs. So you'll never run them through the manufacturing process. They are period costs that get expensed on the income statement in the period in which they were incurred. So let's start with a question. Which of the following costs would be considered a period rather than a product cost in a manufacturing company? Two of them, there are two of them in here. Can you guys help me out? Christopher says, is it A and E? <clears throat> B and E, B and E, B and E. So <laughs> the correct answer is B and E. Why? Think of this, manufacturing equipment is part of the manufacturing cost. So that would be a product cost. Direct materials is a product cost and electrical cost to light the production facility would be also because it's related to the facility to manufacture the goods. Property taxes on corporate headquarters has nothing to do with the manufacturing. So that would be a period cost along with our sales commissions. So suppose you've been given a summer job as an intern, a company that manufactures sophisticated spy cameras for remote controlled military reconnaissance aircraft. The company, which is privately owned, has approached a bank for a loan to help finance its growth. The bank requires financial statements before approving the loan. Let's classify each cost listed on the next slides as either a product cost or a period cost for the purpose of preparing financial statements. So guys, I want, there's five of you in the classroom. So, um, who wants to take the first three? Anna, can you take the first three? Nate, can you take the second three? Christopher, sure. the third three? 
Um, I'm missing somebody. Someone pipe up for the next three. Okay, so just whenever you can just start in and let's just see how we're doing guys. Hey, Annie, you ready? Yep, I am. Okay, do it. You know, the goal, guys, we're learning. Remember, this is learning. Um, the first one, I'm actually not sure about. Okay, so a product cost or period cost. Product costs only deal with manufacturing the goods. So we know anything to do with sales is not a manufacturing cost, so it would be a period cost. Okay. okay. And on the equipment, would that also be a period cost? No, because it's used in the factory. So the factory is where the goods are produced. So uh -huh. anything to do with producing the goods, the, the product is manufacturing. Okay. Sales, um, salespeople don't manufacture the goods. They're just selling them. But anything to do with the factory is going to be a product cost. So number two, rent would be a product cost. Okay. And then the third one would be product. That is excellent. Okay. Next. So the salaries of personnel, um, those that are working on the finished goods, that would be a product cost. Yep. And then I'm not sure. I think with the, you know, it's the soap and paper towels that are used. I think that would probably be a period cost. It would be a product cost. Okay. And then lastly, the factory supervisor salaries, I'd assume maybe is a product cost because it would deal with the. Um, yes, guys, anything to do with the product is going to be a product cost. So soap and paper, I know it sounds so minute, but it's going to be a product cost because you're, you're those that soap and papers for factory workers. Okay. And factors, factory supervisor salaries are also going to be a product cost because it's in the factory. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's just do this right now. Um, let me get to where we're soap and paper product cost f factory product cost um, heat and power product cost okay guys this one tricked me when I did it I was wrong is this one a product cost because it's used the boxing products for shipping it's a, you know, it's a period cost, I believe. And that's what blew my mind because I would have thought just like you, it was a product cost, but the key here is their units are not normally boxed. So the units aren't um, normally being boxed. Therefore it's a, it's a, a period cost to get them shipped.
okay? Now, what about this one, advertising cost? Uh, I said that was a period cost. You got so it. Perfect. It's you're correct. And then anybody on workman's comp for factory employees? Guys, what's the key here? Factory employees, the ones who make the product. Product costs. Christopher, have, have you gone or Nate? I think both of y'all have gone, right? Uh, yeah, I had the third three. Okay, guys, who are we missing? I got to look. Anyway, I'll just keep working. But um, guys, remember, we're working together. You're not supposed to know this. We're learning, okay? Um, so anything related to the factory, will always be product. Anything, as minute as, as it is, it's related to the product. Now, in this case, the wages of the receptionist in the administrative office, that has nothing to do with product, it's period costs. Cost of leasing the corporate jet, period costs. Cost of running rooms in Florida for an, an annual convention, period costs. Cost of packaging the company's product is product cost. That's where it's tricky. If it's normally packaged, it's going to be a product cost. Where we got fooled on that last one is they're not normally packaged. Therefore, that was why that was a period cost. Okay. Now we have cost behavior, meaning we have costs that can be variable. We have costs that can be fixed. And we can also have what's called mixed costs. This, but these refer to how a cost will react to changes in the level of activity. A cost that varies in total in direct proportion to changes in the level of activity is called a variable cost. An activity, here, let me just see what I just did, a variable cost. Now, we often show items in the term of a cost driver. What drives the cost? What causes the incurrence of a variable cost? Sometimes it's units produced, sometimes it's machine hours, sometimes it's labor hours, and there are times it's miles driven. But the number of units is what drives a variable cost or the number of machine hours it takes to complete something or labor hours. Those activities are called cost drivers. And that's what's used for those variable costs. Now, a fixed cost is a cost that remains constant regardless of changes in the level of the activity. If expressed on a per unit basis, the average fixed cost per unit varies inversely with changes in activity. So what they're saying is a fixed cost is fixed no matter what occurs. So a fixed cost may be rent on the, um, on a machine. And as the machine increases in units being produced, that cost will decrease per unit. So we have committed long-term costs that can't really be reduced in the short term. And we have fixed costs that we call discretionary. They can be altered in the short term by management making different decisions. Know that all costs deal with what we call a relevant range. So there may be costs 
and they may be fixed, but the fixed is within what we call a relevant range. A straight line closely approximates a curvilinear variable cost line within the relevant range. The relevant range of activity pertains to fixed cost as well as variable cost. So we have an office space that we rent for 30,000 a year in increments of 1,000 square feet. Well, the fixed cost is fixed as long as we keep that amount of square footage. Of course, they're going to increase as we add an additional 1,000 square feet every time we need more space. That's the purpose of what we're talking about in relevant range. So if we only need 1,000 square feet, that fixed cost is constant. But when we have to increase our square footage, that fixed cost is going to increase because we need more square footage. We have variable cost that increase and decrease in proportion to changes in the activity level. And that variable cost per unit, though, is going to stay constant. However, with fixed cost, Fixed costs are not affected by changes in the activity level within a relevant range. But that fixed cost per unit is going to decrease as the activity level rises and increases as that activity level falls. It makes sense. Baskin Robbins, I like this one. This was my first job I had when I was 15. Which of the following costs would be variable with respect? to the number of ice cream cones sold at Baskin Robbins. Is it the cost of lighting the store, the wages of the store manager, the cost of ice cream, or the cost of napkins for a customer? The cost of the ice cream is going to be variable with respect to the number of ice cream cones sold. If we only sell 100 ice cream cones, the cost is going to be 100 ice cream cones times X. However, if we sell 1,000 ice cream cones, we're going to have a lot more ice cream cost. And the same is true of napkins. The cost of lighting the store and the wages for the store manager aren't going to change based on how many ice cream cones we sell. How's everyone doing so far? Is it clicking? Now listed on the next slide are costs of providing an airline service. So classify each cost as either variable or fixed and either direct or indirect. Consider the cost object to be the flight. Flight attendants and pilots are paid based on hours of flight time. So advertising, that's going to be a fixed cost and it's indirect. It's not associated with that flight. Beverages served on an airplane are going to be variable based on how many number of people are on the airplane. And it's directly associated with that flight. Where the regional VP salary has nothing to do directly with that flight. So it's going to be a fixed cost and it's indirect. The depreciation on the ground equipment is also beneficial for this flight, but it is not directly related to this flight. Okay. Fuel used in planes is direct. Wait, what am I doing wrong? I'm going backwards. That doesn't help. Um, fuel used in planes is variable and direct based on how far the, the destination is. 
and it's directly associated with the flight. Same with the wages and the pilot salaries. Now the aircraft maintenance salary, manager salary, would be indirect because it's not associated specifically with this flight. So we are talking about mixed co um, variable costs and fixed costs, and we can have a mixed cost, which is a combination of the fixed and the variable. Utility costs can be a combination of fixed and variable. Okay, sorry. Um, in that, you may have a fixed fee each month, but then you'll have a variable cost based on how many kilowatt hours are used throughout the month. So in order to determine these mixed costs, we look at the total cost equaling the fixed plus the variable cost times the level of activity. So the fixed amount plus what the variable cost is per wattage um, kilowatt hour times how many kilowatt hours were needed. If your fixed monthly utility charge is 40 bucks and your variable cost is three cents per kilowatt hour and your monthly activity level is 2000 kilowatt hours, what is the amount of your utility bill? So you see the 40 plus the three cents times 2000 kilowatt hours gives us our $100, okay? Now, Northeast Hospital's radiology department is considering replacing an old inefficient x-ray machine with the state-of-the-art digital x-ray machine. The new machine would provide higher quality x-rays in less time and at a lower cost per x-ray. It would also require less power and would use a color laser printer to produce easily readable x-ray images. Instead of investing the funds in a new x-ray machine, the lab department is lobbying the hospital's management to buy a new DNA analyzer. So for each of the items, indicate by placing an X in the appropriate column, whether it should be considered a differential cost, a sunk cost, an opportunity cost. Now, that's not helpful because we haven't even talked about these, talked about these. so let's go and talk about these different types of costs. Okay, differential cost are the difference in the cost between two alternatives. So a differential cost are always relevant to the decisions, but a differential cost is two options, okay? An opportunity cost is the potential benefit that gets given up when one alternative is selected over another. Now, accounting records won't show what we didn't do or what we could have done, but you need to look at those opportunity costs when making decisions. As this slide is saying, what's the opportunity cost you incur by attending class? Well, by attending class and bettering your future employment, you may be not working at this moment. So the opportunity cost is what you are giving up by doing what you are doing. And then sunk costs are costs that have already occurred and it doesn't matter. We call sunk costs irrelevant costs. They should not matter in making decisions. It's already happened. Therefore, there's nothing you can do about it. A sunk cost is a cost that cannot be recovered. They're sometimes contrasted with prospective costs, which can be future costs that may be incurred or changed 
if an action is taken. So uh, if we go back to these, uh, that slide where we were talking about these different items, um, basically what we're looking at is the cost of an old x-ray machine has already happened. It's a sunk cost. The salary of the head of the radiology department. Oh, differential. Why did I? Let me see what's differential cost, sunk cost. I think the radiology department isn't anything. Differential sunk. So cost of the new. What was the question here? Maybe that would help. I got myself. Uh, for each of these, indicate by placing the appropriate column whether it is considered a differential, a sunk, or an opportunity cost. If none of the categories apply, leave them blank. So the cost of the old x-ray machine is sunk. The salary department head and the radiology for radiology and lab are none of those. The cost of the new color laser printer is a differential cost because they could have picked that or another one. Rent in the space occupied by radiology is would be none of these. The cost of maintaining the old machine would be a differential cost because you have a choice between maintaining the old machine or purchasing a new machine. Okay. The benefits of a new DNI analyzer would be an opportunity cost. We haven't purchased it yet, but if we had this, how would that benefit us? And the cost of electricity to run the X-ray machines we would show as a differential cost, okay? Just so you know those, I didn't want to um, slip slide over those. So moving on. Here we have um, someone who is trying to decide, do I drive or take a train to Portland? I have the money, but I don't want to waste money needlessly, so I want to figure out what should I do. So what is relevant in making this decision? Should the cost of the train ticket affect the decision of whether you drive or take the train? Absolutely, it is relevant. Suppose you're trying to decide whether to drive. Um, is the annual cost of licensing your car relevant? No, that should not be relevant in making this decision because you're going to do, it's a sunk cost. It's already occurred. What if your car could be sold now for $5,000? Is this a sunk cost? Yes. It would have already occurred. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant in the decision making. Okay, now preparing an income statement for a merchandising company, it's a little different than for just a service company. We've got under the traditional format where we show our sales, our cost of goods sold, to come up with our gross margin and our selling expenses. This is common when we use it for external reporting purposes. They don't care to know all the detail. But for managerial accounting, it's those individuals inside the company that are using this detailed information to make decisions about the company. So the more detail, the better. So the contribution format income statement is beneficial for those used within the company because it breaks out variable expenses from fixed expenses to give us our net operating net operating income. This is used for internal planning and we're going to talk about it in other chapters when we talk about the contribution format income statement. So here we've got Marwick's piano, purchases pianos from a large manufacturer for an average cost of $2,450 
per unit and then sells them to retail customers for an average price of $3,125 each. Companies selling an administrative cost are shown here. They want us to provide a traditional format income statement and then a contribution format income statement. They're saying during the period they sold 40 pianos. So using a traditional income statement, we're going to show the sale. We're going to show the cost of goods sold of the piano. And then we come up with our gross margin. After all our various selling and administrative expenses, we come up with our net income. This is what we've been familiar with. However, doing a contribution format statement is very different. We take all the variable expenses, all of them, and we're going to take those and we're going to take any variable cost and show the variable expense. And then all of our fixed costs and we're going to show the fixed expense. So as you see here, we've got our variable costs of per piano and the sales commissions and the delivery of pianos and the clerical. That total are variable expenses. And then after all of our fixed expenses, we show our net operating income. Fixed costs stay constant in total, but by per unit inversely gets changed as our activity level increases. So the fixed costs will decrease on a per unit basis, showing fixed cost on a per unit basis on the income statement can mislead management thinking that those fixed costs behave in the same way as variable costs, but they don't. Fixed costs generally are shown only in totals on the contribution format statement. So guys, there was a lot we covered this week. We're just learning new concepts. And so sometimes in learning new concepts, I mean, it's we're picking up a whole new language. Um, what I'd like to do is show you um, the homework. Now, one thing I want to and I I'm I'm expecting everyone to um, um, listen to this lecture in in its entirety, but my one request is when you do the Excel assignment, please make sure when you save it, you save it to you save it with your first and last name, and you say chapter one. Okay, so it's really important that you save it and put it specifically um, your name and chapter one. One thing I do want to explain is that there are two parts to this homework. Okay, so you're supposed to open this page. Okay, enable. And they want you to take these question marks and fill in the formula. So here it's got a question mark to it. So you're going to want to show sales would be B4. Cost of goods sold would be.
just here. The cost of goods sold would just be there, our cost of goods sold. Our gross margin would be our sales minus our cost of goods sold. Correct? Our selling and administrative expenses. Our selling would be a combination of the variable plus the fixed. Our administrative would be a combination of the variable plus the fixed. Do you see what I'm doing? They want you to make sure you understand how all of the um, spots, how it all makes sense. So they want you to come in here and fill in the formulas to create this section. They want you to do it the same for the variable. So basically what they want you to do is understand the difference between these two statements. I know I'm being putsy, but it's really important to me that you guys get it right when you submit your homework, okay? Oops. Okay, so that is the first um, part of the form. You're going to file, you're going to be able to save it. I would say, um, Nancy, she made chapter one, part one. And I would save it to that first section. Okay, then it asks you after entering the formulas, verify the dollar amounts in both the traditional and, and to make sure that they match the numbers in exhibit 17. Check your worksheet by changing the variable selling cost in the data area to $900. So now I'm gonna change the variable selling to $900. And then it says, keeping all the other data the same, your worksheet is operating properly. If the net operating income under the traditional format should now be 700 and the contribution margin should now be 4,700. So if we show 700 and 4,700, we are right. So then you're going to again, save this for part two and you're gonna load that to part two. Does that make sense? So I don't think, unless I act as a student, let me see if I can. Uh, sometimes I, that's a view as a student. So if I go into my chapter one Excel, I continue and what I will do 
is four shoot my problem is I don't know where I saved it to uh Well, what do you know, dummy me? Okay, here I am. Chapter one, I'm gonna save this part two. So I've got it right because this is where I'm gonna grade you. Um, download reference file. I don't know if, let's see if I can now change all the dollar amounts in the data for your work. So it looks like this. I guess that was part one that I should have just saved to, okay? Now it says here, change all the amounts. If your formulas are correct, you should get the correct answers to the following questions. And then it's gonna ask, what is your gross margin? What is your net operating income? And what is your contribution margin now? So you're going to want to fill in all of these questions too. You can check your work on this one, but just make sure you submit your homework, that Excel file with your name on it, so that can be graded accordingly. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, no? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so that is important for um, your Excel. For your homework this week, you will have um, 100 points here. Espresso Express operates a number of espresso coffee stands in busy suburban malls. The weekly, the fixed weekly expense of a coffee stand is 1200 and the variable cost per cup of coffee served is 22 cents. Okay, fill in the following table with your estimates of the company's total cost and average cost per cup of coffee at the indicated levels of activity. So does the average cost per cup of coffee served increase, decrease, or remain the same as the number of cups, cups of coffee served in a week increases? So our fixed costs are $1,200 dollars, right? And our variable costs Excuse me one sec. Let me just pull this up. So um, does anyone have uh, 22 cents by 2,000 cups? 22 cents by 2,100 cups? I'm just getting my Excel up here. Okay. 
I should always have two computers available. One second, guys. Okay. Okay, so 22 cents, uh, 2,000 cups here for 40, and 2,100 at 22 cents for 62, and then 2,200 for 84. So average cup per cough, average cost per cup of coffee served, um, 1,640. Divide that by 2,000 is 82 cents. Um, this one, 791, and this one, 765. Okay. So, does the average cost per cup of coffee increase, decrease, or remain the same? as the number cups of coffee served in a week increases. What does it do, guys? It decreases, doesn't it? It decreases as the number of cups of coffee go down or increase because of the fixed rent, okay? Now, the next one. I don't know why it does that. See how you can use your ebook here when you're in your assignment. I don't know why it's not letting me move on. Hmm. There it goes. Okay, so this next um, um, exercise has you prepare a traditional income statement and then a contribution format statement. So that's what you're gonna do there. This next one, coupons, Um, company relevant range of production is 8,000, 18,000 to 22,000 units. When it produces and sells 20,000 units, its average cost per unit are as follows. So what we have to do is it shows the direct materials when we're dealing with 20,000 units the direct labor, variable manufacturing overhead, fixed, fixed selling, fixed admin, sales commission, and variable administrative, okay? So it says, assume the cost object is units of production. What is the total direct manufacturing cost incurred to make 20,000 units? Well, um, to make 20,000 units, the direct material per cost is seven bucks. Okay. The direct labor per unit 
is four dollars. So our to our direct manufacturing cost per unit is eleven bucks. The number of units that are going to be produced and sold we have is twenty thousand. The direct manufacturing cost is two hundred and twenty thousand. Our variable manufacturing cost per unit is a dollar fifty. Our fixed manufacturing overhead per unit is five dollars. Again, our number of units produced here, 20,000. So our total indirect manufacturing cost there is 130,000, okay? Now our next requirement says, assume the cost object is the manufacturing department and that its total output is 20,000 units. How much total manufacturing cost is directly traceable to the manufacturing department? Round per unit values to two decimal places. Okay, so our direct material cost, seven bucks. Our direct labor cost, four bucks. Our variable manufacturing, I thought it was a buck fifty, a buck fifty. Our fixed manufacturing, I thought was five, fixed manufacturing, five. Okay. So we've got 1750 in manufacturing cost times 20,000 units. Okay. Total indirect cost, none. Then the sales commission per unit is a buck. We have 20,000 units sold. So we have 20,000 in sales commissions. Then we show Twenty thousand fixed portion a uh, fixed portion of sales um, cost is twenty thousand. Jim. Yeah. So our total direct selling is 40 and our total indirect selling $50,000. There. Okay. Let's move on. So I'm gonna let you work on four on your own. I'll, I'll kind of go through here. Kubin's company's relevant range um, Kubin's relevant range of production is 18 to 22. When it produces and sells 20,000 units, the cost are as follows. If 18,000 units are produced and sold, what is the variable cost per unit produced and sold? So if we do 18,000 units, um, we would have $7 in direct material, four in direct labor, that's 11, Variable 150, sales commission of one, variable administrative of 50 cents. So that would be 
fourteen dollars. Uh, and then variable cost with twenty two thousand units would also be fourteen thousand fourteen dollars. Um, our number of units sold of 18,000 units here. 18,000 units would be 252,000 over there. Here it would be 308,000. The average fixed manufacturing cost per unit produced is going to be different on 18,000 units. That's going to show um, the 100,000 divided by 18,000 units of 556. Over here, 22,000 units would be $4.55. So ultimately, here, total amount of fixed manufacturing overhead is going to be 100,000, no matter how many units are sold. Okay. So you're going to, um, I, I did it up for this one. Um, sorry, you're gonna figure that out. Uh, incremental manufacturing costs. I'm gonna let you try to figure that one out. Now, for number seven. Harris Company manufactures and sells a single product. A partially completed schedule of the company's total cost and cost per unit over the relevant range of 30,000 to 50,000 units is given below. Complete the schedule of the company's total cost and cost per unit as given in the relevant tab below. Assume that the company produces and sells 45,000 units during the year at a selling price of 16 per unit. Then we prepare a format income statement for the year. So for requirement one, we are figuring out the variable cost for 30,000 units. And we've been given the variable cost here is 180,000. And the fixed cost is 300,000. Now to figure out the variable cost per unit, we're gonna take that 180,000 divided by 30,000 units to come up with 180 divided by 30,000 is six bucks a unit. And the fixed cost per unit is going to be 10 bucks, 300 divided by 30,000. So we get our total cost per unit. So when we go and do 40,000 units, our, our variable cost here is going to be 240,000, excuse me, 40 times six, 240,000. Our fixed costs are going to stay the same at 30. Here we've got six. And now our fixed costs, because we're selling more, are going to go down to $7.50 per unit, excuse me. Okay. If we do the 50,000 variable cost times six bucks, that's at 300,000. Our fixed stay at 300. Again, our variable cost are six, but our fixed cost per unit now, guys, they're going down to six bucks a unit. So do you see as we produce more, our total cost per unit are decreasing. Now, our contribution to 
income statement. This is our sales. Company produces and sells 45,000 units at 16 bucks per unit. That's going to be 720,000. This is sales. Oops. Then we've got our variable expenses. Six bucks per unit. Uh, let's see here. Six bucks per unit would be uh, times 45,000, 270,000. We've got our contribution margin to be the difference. The 720 minus the 270 or 50. Our fixed expenses. Would be the flat 300,000. To come up with our net operating income. To be 150. Okay, so I've given you some help on some of this homework. You've got this video so you can go back and look at it. Um, just please make sure that if you have questions, there's a discussion in the um, chapter one where you can ask questions and work together. You guys can respond to each other and work together. If you go to the links into this discussion, you can ask questions, okay? Make sure that the problems that I've already helped you with, you go back and review them when you complete your work so that will help you guys. So as we end, any questions, guys? How's everyone doing? Did I lose you?